All right. Now, in this very special edition podcast, I'm going to do a few things that I've I've rarely done before. I'm going to try to explain to you how I write down my speeches. Now, very rarely do I actually write them down unless they're going to be somewhat complicated. But this speech uh, that I'm, I'm, I'm giving you basically what I would consider a speech. If I were to make a public a- a appearance somewhere, this that I, I, I have in front of me, and I have this picture, this photo available that's linked. You can, you can find it uh, wherever. You should be able to get this and follow this chart that I've written out. And it's got some red and blue and green. It's got a few circles and some squiggly lines and stuff. This is how I outline my speeches. And at some point in the future, I may give a lesson on how I structure my speeches this way. And so I hope that you can, if you're interested anyway, uh, follow along with my speech here and see um, how I make things work. Again, I, you, well, you remember the five paragraph essay thing in high school that you, you got introduction, you got three main points, you got your conclusion and summary. I, I remember teaching ESL students in Asia how to write basic composition. We were doing the five paragraph essay and I told them you can't construct your idea from the five paragraph essay. You must construct your idea like a, like a map first. Or, or like uh, different objects in a room, like like you're describing the layout of a room or a scene or something. You need to, you need to have, have a picture you're looking at or you're, something you're describing. That's how you have to think of the idea you want to present. And I would use circles and triangles and squares to try to explain, you know, examples and, and things to do and then teaching ideas and conclusions and maybe you have a theme. And I draw a big circle with four boxes inside of it and I'd say, here you've got a, a big idea, but you've got like four practical steps, uh, three, however. And I and say, you think about all this and then put that into your five paragraph essay outline. And, and of course, I, the other thing I always explained was the reason why uh, teachers in school want these introductions and conclusions is so that the teacher can get through all 500 of the students' papers more quickly. You know, t- teachers have a lot of work to do. And teachers are, I mean, teachers are qu- highly qualified, smart people. You don't become a teacher without some qualifications. Um, some teachers might be lazy, but teachers are smart people. So we want to get them around a lot of students. Well, that means the teacher is going to be busy so that the teacher cannot give an entire day to critique every single weekly assignment. The teacher's got to go through it kind of quickly. And so five paragraph essays force the student to kind of know what he's talking about or her, for those of you uh, who aren't aware that the masculine speaks for. Anyhow, but speaking of English, the teacher will want students to write an introduction, write a conclusion and say, uh, you know, tell me what you're thinking about, and then I can breeze through it quickly and understand quickly. Five paragraph essays are for academic purposes. That's not how to write a paper. Newspapers, best-selling poems, all the, the books, they don't use that because that's actually not how it works. Word count minimums and introductions are for academics. But in actual news or book writing, it's a word count maximum because less is more. So, I am going to try to explain a political idea. I'm giving you my own political paradigm. And I I don't favor Republicans or Democrats. Uh, I do have my opinions. And I'm going to try to keep my opinions on the side because I want you to hear my political paradigm that you probably aren't going to hear from many other people. I actually have concerns about Donald Trump and I'm a conservative. I support what Trump's doing, but I'm worried about what he's doing. And I haven't heard anyone explain this idea. So I hope that you can listen objectively. I'm not going to try to persuade you. I'm going to try to explain myself. Now, there is one thing I will try to persuade you of. I'm going to tell you that right now. Obama could have done a better job to make sure that his work lasted. That's, that's, that's the only thing I will try to persuade you of, and I've already told you. So there's nothing else that I'm going to try to persuade you of. 
And I'm not going to give you a hard sales pitch for that either. I'm going to try to explain an idea and I'm going to specifically my political paradigm. And I'm going to use this form of a speech outline that you can look at to understand how I structure any idea that I'm going to try to give a talk about. And hopefully maybe you can use that in your own speeches or how to craft or draft your own letters. But first, I need to push the stop button and go get a drink of water because otherwise I'm just going to be, I'm just, hold on a second here. Oh, oh, that was, um, oh, that, oh, <clears throat> now I understand why they have a glass of water for a speaker who's giving a long political speech or any type of speech for that matter. All right. Thank you for that introduction. I hope that this is useful for you. I'm showing you how I think. I won't do that often. And now I'm going to get to this. Donald Trump <clears throat> wants to do two particular things, generally speaking. One, he wants to build roads and bridges, infrastructure. He wants to build. Government is going to pay for stuff. We're going to build stuff. Another thing he wants to do is he wants to balance government power. He wants to... Yeah, balance, you know, clean up, do spring cleaning, trim off the fat, make it more lean, have Vatican II update type of stuff for government laws. Now, typically, roads and bridges are a Democrat political campaign point, aren't they? I mean, I, I, I said so many, I've seen so many, you know, Democrat voting professional teachers in, in, um, in public education somewhere or in college, which is mostly public. I, I no, not the government ever. Did, did, we never got anything big done without government. Government built the roads. Government built, built the railroad. Government gave us our highways. Government tells us what side. Government, everything is been done with government. You don't have government. You can't get anything done. I've heard the argument. I don't agree about everything. Uh, not, you know, being done because of government. But I, I agree that a lot of things get done because of government. And that is a Democrat talking point, usually. Usually Republicans let the private sector do it, right? Okay. Well, Trump wants the government to build roads and bridges. That is a Democrat thing to do. Why didn't Obama? Just saying. By Obama not doing what Democrats do, which is to do roads and bridges, that is... That uh, gave Trump a lot of Democrat votes. I haven't seen people talk much about that. That's a subtle little academic observation. O Obama should have done more with roads and bridges. And I don't accept this excuse that, well, they, they just they didn't, you couldn't do it because people opposed him because he was black and all white people hate black people. Uh, and that's, I, I don't, I don't, I think that's excuse making. I don't think, I think, I think Obama was too young. What, he was in his 40s? Trump's in his 70s? I mean, you know, I mean, I don't want to get too much into it, but that's the only thing I would try to persuade you of is Obama could have done a better job. And if he had done a better job, then Trump would not have been able to campaign partially, maybe small partially on roads and bridges. Now, balancing government and law. There are two basic archetypes. It's like a, like a core idea of a person that I want to explain to you. I want to explain to you the liberal, not, not Democrat. I did. I was in Chicago and Ch Chicago Democrats are, are not liberals. They're, they're, there's a difference. There's a liberal and then there's a conservative. And I, I really believe that a lot of Democrat voters can't articulate a conservative in such a way that it would be recognizable. Right? Try to follow me with this. Many times, when there's an opinion out there, we disagree with the opinion. We'll say, oh, they just think that it's... And then we say it in this way that, that like, they hate pink ponies and, and they want to outlaw tacos and, and burritos and, and, and hamburgers and water. And they just, just hate everything. And many times, we humans will represent, will explain an opinion we disagree with as if that opinion is much worse than it actually is. A very few Democrats will actually be, I think, 
and I've, I'm 36 years old. I've traveled the world. I I think what I've seen from this based on that, I think a lot of Democrats really don't know how to explain what a conservative is so that you could recognize that he was talking about a conservative or her. For those of you who don't understand in English that he refers to he or she when we don't want to bloat our words and make our tweets all the longer. So uh, we've got these two archetypes, the conservative and the liberal. I think the Republicans and the Democrats are both fake for the record. So I'm only going to talk in the conservative and liberal archetypes. And then I'm going to, I'm actually eventually going to touch on the fake Republicans and the fake Democrats. I, I mean, I arguably a Democrat that doesn't build roads and bridges, I think is a fake Democrat. I think, I think that's, that's, I mean, it's a, a, a Democrat who doesn't get somehow get the public money to get the roads and bridges built is, is like a Republican who votes a, in favor of abortion. It's something's not right there. Democrats are supposed to build roads and bridges. I mean, that's FDR, man. And I like roads and bridges and I wish Republicans would build them. That's something that kind of bugs me, but I do know. I mean, I, I remember being in college. One of my professors talked about, he says, my son's a Christian and he's in college and he reads his Bible every day and his roommate's an atheist. And one day my Christian son woke up and was angry and went to class and his atheist roommate said, what? You're a Christian. You're supposed to read your Bible every day. You read your Bible every day. You've got to read it today. He was like, what? Even my atheist friend is telling me that I have to keep acting like a good Christian? I feel like the atheist here saying that Democrats are supposed to build roads and bridges. What happened? All right. Okay. I don't want to go off on that too long. So here we have the conservative archetype and the Democrat archetype. No, no, the liberal archetype. Excuse me. I misspoke and I'm not editing it. Basic archetype of a conservative. Government needs a proper balance. The Declaration of Independence complained about having laws that were a disaster. They just didn't help. They just got in the way and annoyed people. Like, like putting a stamp on every piece of paper. Like if you had a little, like a three by four notebook, three by four inch notebook that you can put in your hip pocket, like that was supposed to have a government paid for stamp on every single page of it. That was the stamp act. And there were laws like this just to annoy people. Then there weren't enough laws that were good. Uh, they, they, there were, they needed laws and regulation. And, and I mean, you know, Franklin was inventing his stove and just, there was lots of stuff going on and we needed to have laws to govern. We needed to make some laws and the declaration of independence complained that we didn't have enough good laws pass and that the King of England wouldn't, wouldn't let them. So there is a balance. You need laws, but the laws need to be useful, accurate, not harassing and annoying. They need to be proper. You can't make a law that you have to put a left-handed glove on your right hand. You need to put a right-handed glove on your right hand. Laws are not automatically smart. This is conservative thinking. Laws are not automatically brilliant by definition. You have to work. You have to learn. You have to listen to people. You have to have experience. You have to do a good job. Writing laws is a skill like, like singing or, or painting or doing any type of work, running an athlete. It just Laws are not automatically always wonderful. You've got to make sure that they're done by the right people. That's conservative thinking. And we need to have laws that are, that are, that are good, the result of good work, good, skillfully written laws. And that's, that's, that, that largely involves people who've lived life. It's, it's why, it's why Congress has hearings where they invite experts to come talk. It's why, it's why governments pay experts to go talk to companies to learn what, you know, how life works. What, what are the inventions your company's making? What, what are we going to need to regulate in the future? I, I, I mean, you know, drones. I mean, we got people flying drones in their neighbor's backyard spying on them. Well, how, how are we going to, how are we going to regulate that? I mean, do, do we need to have a drone pilot's license? Well, probably not, but 
what are we going to do? I mean, this is an important question to ask. And, and you don't learn how to answer that question just by studying law cases and learning how to be a lawyer. I mean, if, if, if you want to know how to deal with drones, how to make laws for, for flying drones, you should probably live in a community with a lot of drones. So we, or you probably should talk to companies that use drones. Amazon wants to use drones to deliver packages to people. So, uh, laws are a skill. Making good laws is something that needs to be done by good work. And if we don't do a good job, we'll have bad, nasty, annoying laws that really mess things up for everybody. And you know something? When the people in government, when the lawmakers don't want to do a good job, when they're too busy playing their little corruption games, when they're too busy writing a law that'll keep their rich, evil friends happy, as opposed to their good, rich friends, which they probably don't have good friends. But it, I mean, when, when the politicians had their own little games going, hey, give me a million dollars. I'll write that part of the law you want. When they're doing that, they don't care about writing good laws. Part of the key to writing good laws is experience in the real world, not just as a lawyer. But part of writing good laws is also that you want to write good laws instead of just want to exploit your position so you can get extra money as a politician. So, I haven't said anything right here. I, I don't believe I've said anything that a Democrat disagrees with, a Democrat voter. That's right. What I've been saying is the idea that motivates conservatives. That, that's that core idea. We need to have a proper balance, not too much, but not too little, government law. It can never disturb people. Second core concept of a conservative. I'm going to explain this idea briefly about the Second Amendment. There are three basic understandings of the Second Amendment that people have, and I prefer the third. I've never heard many people, not many people, talk about the third. Usually, Second Amendment is seen in terms of hunters being able to keep their guns. Then, we have this other idea that the purpose of having guns is so that we can fight the police. Um, well, uh, that's a half-truth. I, I, I think there's something to that. I mean, if if every home has a lot of guns then then Nazi police like a Gestapo style police situation will be very very difficult there's something to that but the purpose of guns is not so that you can walk down the street and shoot a police officer um that's there there's more to that the the idea of of people owning large amounts of guns is so that a militia is able to organize under leaders that the state government appointed, not the federal government, and that the, but the, those militia leaders can organize themselves just at any time. Okay, the state put me in power, and uh, that's it. Uh, we're militia. We're going to action. And they don't need any further... Um, of course, they're not going to do that much, because the militia is made up of volunteers who are busy and have lives, and they'll only go if they really, really need to. That... There's something to that. That's that's the argument for the well-regulated militia being necessary. Then, we've got another issue. And this is something that I've seen living in another country for eight years. I'm over here in China's backyard. And I don't know if you've seen the statistics that the largest army in the world is not China. I mean largest government army in the world is China. The largest actual army with guns in the world is America's hunters. And the hunters in, in just one single state, choose you know most states, the hunters in that state alone, it just a state, is oftentimes a larger army than most countries in the world. Most of them, not, not the largest, but collectively America's hunters are the largest army in the world. 
And when the Chinese are sitting in their intel briefing rooms and they're asking, how can we invade America? How, how, because countries are always, I mean, I, I believe that the United States has theoretical, I mean, I, I don't have any proof for this, but as I understand, you know, all of the large countries have a, a theoretical plan for invading every country in the world. The U.S. probably has plans for invading Canada. Uh, you know, probably just in case, oh, oh, who invaded Canada? The North Koreans took over Canada? Well, we got to go invade and take it back. So they've already got the plans to, in case they, I think, I mean, okay, but so the Chinese, whether, whether they're bad or whether it's routine, when they're discussing their inevitably predictable plans for invading the United States, they're always beating their heads against their desks saying, but what are we going to do about the hunters? What are we going to do about the largest army in the world? Once we get into that country, they've got more guns and people than our military does. What are we going to do? And that's an aspect of the Second Amendment that a lot of people don't mention. And that is part of conservative thinking about the need to have guns in the hands of good, honest civilians. Now, in my book, The People's Party, I explain that one of the important parts of the Second Amendment should be to have a militia training class in high school. Uh, but, you know, there are things we can do that need to address the Second Amendment. I, I, don't, I don't know that gun ownership should just be allowed for just anyone. I, I, I think that you should have to take a gun training class as part of high school, like you're required to graduate. Like if you don't take that class necessary to graduate from high school, then you're not allowed to own a gun. Uh, I, I believe that sort of. So I don't want to get too long on that, but these are, this is my archetype explanation of two basic matters of, of conservative thought. Uh, all right. George, the podcast observer, has suggested that I explain a little bit about the conservative pro-life perspective. There might be pro-choice conservatives. So I want to clarify that. Uh, I don't, I don't want to get into fighting. I want to explain stuff. But since pro-life is oftentimes a part of the conservative package, and there could be pro-choice conservatives, of course, I understand that. I should probably explain the pro-life perspective. <clears throat> there are many arguments for the pro-life perspective. The pro-choice perspective is about choice. Okay? And it, they have their arguments. Um, <clears throat> the pro-life perspective, there's the moral perspective. Do we have the right to play God? Uh, it is murder or whatever, as, as they explain, and as I happen to believe... I'm not trying to persuade you in this. I'm trying to explain. But then we've got another issue. Birth rate. Taiwan has a declining birth rate. It's an economic problem. It's a big problem. Um, birth rates are a huge, huge problem. And... The only people group I know of that has a huge booming birth rate are Muslims from specific Middle Eastern ethnicities. When a people group ha makes it that much easier to uh, decline your own birth rate, abortion does make it easier to do that. Um, your ethnic group, I mean... You've instituted a policy to slowly, slowly, slowly put your own ethnic group uh, into extinction. That is a problem. Now, we also have a familial problem. I remember in the 90s when the sex education curriculum tried to tell us that kids could not control themselves. And now we look at video game addiction and I say, hooey, if kids can discipline themselves to keep playing video games, they can... We can do stuff if we want to. People are able to achieve things. I mean, we have all these, we have so many stories all over the internet about 
about some kid that worked hard to get something done. I just saw a story the other day about uh, two African-American, want to be called black, I'm being technical, so we're not talking about Africa, two African-American black uh, twin brothers. And, and they would, it was like a three one hundredths of a percent away from one being the valedictorian and the other being the salutatorian. It's like, it was a success story. Wow, they got so much done because their mother wouldn't let them settle for less. You know, we, we see all these stories about kids doing amazing things, yet... We were teaching them in the 90s that they can't control themselves as far as sex is concerned. Really? I mean, if abortion weren't such an option, maybe people wouldn't be uh, involved in so much sexual promiscuity. And then that opens up another question about family. I mean, children who grow up not knowing their father, uh, are they happy? Do, Do they struggle to do things in life? I mean, if, if, if children grow up in a home where there's a mother and a father, those children will grow up knowing what an adult man and an adult woman uh, should act like. They'll, they'll know who to look for in a spouse, regardless of whether they're boys or girls growing up. And they'll grow up relatively happy. So the idea of wanting to preserve family and save sex for marriage is not a horrible, terrible, mean, angry, let's condemn and control people principle. It has good results. And abortion is a way of trying to enable bad behavior while avoiding some of the results. So those are some of the arguments. I'm not trying to be persuasive with them. Those are some of the arguments for pro-life. I don't I don't want to persuade as far as that concerned. My only opinion in this is uh, that uh, Democrats should uh, build roads and bridges. That's the only thing I'd try to persuade you of. Obama should have built more roads and bridges. Now we've got the archetype of the liberal. I do not believe that this liberal archetype defines most Democrats. But this is the archetype. It's the core idea of the ideal perfect liberal. And this is where it goes. The working definition, not what I suspect is their goal. This is what happens. This may not be true, but if you follow this, it will be predictable. All right. Now that I've got mom tone of voice out of the way, here's the archetype of a liberal. Lots of pop culture. At one point, the KKK was popular, and that was arguably the liberal militant. When the KKK became unpopular, the Black Panthers showed up. And then when all that became less popular, although today it does seem to be resurging a little bit, they took to BET. Now, were you aware that, you know, Black Entertainment Television, are you aware that a lot of black hip-hop music is actually controlled by white people who hate black people? Did you ever think that maybe they had a motivation? I mean, if you grow up with the lifestyle of the lyrics and the videos, what we see in the videos, you're not going to have a stable, secure, happy, reliable life. The liberal archetype tries to put their ideas, their goals into school, such as sex education. Oh, you can't control it. You're just going to have sex all the time. Right. And that led to breakdown of the family. Among other things, it led to breakdown of the family. But just giving out free money, there's a problem with free money. I don't know if you've ever dealt with with children growing up. Um, Maybe you didn't have any brothers or sisters and you've never been around people growing up. But when children don't learn that mistakes have not fun results, those children aren't going to learn how to, how to try to do something and actually do it. I mean, you know the spoiled, rotten brat children. You know, they always want what they want, and then they cry and cry until mommy gives it to them, and they're just annoying to deal with when they get older. That's what free money does to people. They, they whine and complain, and they're always unhappy. They never figure out how to get what they want. They just want someone to give me what I want. They don't know how to go get it themselves. They don't know how to step up and lead. And so free money, again, helps people avoid those consequences. And the conservative mind doesn't want that. But whether it's intended or not, 
that is where the liberal, the ideal liberal person's rules will eventually always lead to free money. Again, they did the KKK back when the KKK was popular, and then they stopped doing that, and they hurt black people uh, by uh, giving them free money. Now, again, not their intention necessarily, but that's where the ideal liberals' methods always lead to. And it's interesting that in the liberal thinking, I didn't write this down in my notes, but the liberal thinking seems to place the value on trying, not on whether you can actually get the job done. Well, he tried, didn't he? Well, you know, um, Obama should have tried harder then to get roads and bridges built. If you supported Obama, the one thing I'm going to try to persuade you of in this is that if Obama had actually gotten something done instead of just making it all about effort, like my liberal archetype idea here does, Trump might not be able to get elected. If you hate Trump, you can thank Obama not having actually got the roads and roads and bridges built. And thank him that effort doesn't count. Effort didn't stop Trump. If you're if you don't like Trump. Liberals love to do things and call it's a good cause. We just want to help people. That's what, what do you believe that conservatives don't want to help people? Conservatives want the actual method that will actually help people. Conservatives don't hate people. But when a liberal describes the conservative, you might think that he would, but that's not an actual accurate definition. Some call that a straw man, but it's, a, it's like a fake description of someone else. But liberals act as if they invented the very concept of goodness and wonderfulness. I want to help people. I'm the only person who does, actually. And I invented the idea of helping people, uh, actually. Uh, and then they give out free bread to everybody, but... Intentional or not, the bread is poisoned. And, uh, you know, they, they have this idea that everyone else hates good ideas. No, they don't. Liberals did not invent love. But the liberal archetype, intentional or not, wants people to think that those liberals invented the idea of love. Well, then we get to the Democrats and the Republicans. The Democrats failed to build roads and bridges, even though that's one of their big campaign things. We need government because we've got to build roads and bridges. Obama didn't do that. And when Democrats, the politicians get in power, here's what we end up with. A lot of laws that are a mess. It's a law mess. The laws they write don't reflect reality. I mean, I, I have a very good friend on the south side of Chicago who is so happy that with the uh, with uh, the Affordable Health Care Act, also known as Obamacare, that he was finally able to get health insurance. But then he kept getting getting laid off from work. And his, his, his woman left him. It never occurred to him that, that Obamacare gave his employers so much difficulty that layoffs were more likely. And he was upset that Trump got elected. It never occurred to him that bad laws were behind the trouble for his employer. And many liberals would say, oh, that's just an excuse. You're just trying to, they've got all the money they need. They're big and rich. They're a big company, right? Not necessarily. I mean, uh, General Motors one time declared only a $1 profit. Of course, that was creative accounting, but no. Money, no matter how big, is not infinite. If you've got a million dollars and then a hundred thousand employees, that's not a large salary for everybody. So we've got uh, this law mess. We need to fix health care, but we need to do it the right way. That's what a conservative thinks. But what did the Democrats do? They did it wrong. Why did people vote for Trump? Because Obama's health care plan had lots of problems. It wasn't well written. 
If you, Obama did not do anyone a good service by the laws that he got passed. They irritated too many people. Doesn't it make you wonder if secretly Obama wanted Trump to get elected? Did you ever think? Just, I don't think he did, but it's a thought. The other thing is, we don't have regulation where we need it. We've got a, we've got a big lawless mess. We had crime and riots increasing all over the country. People got hurt. Bit businesses got burned. The roads are in decay. There was a lack of regulation. When Democrats are in power, many things lack regulation. We need laws, not lawlessness. What ends up happening is when Democrats get in power, they've got their good causes. They've got stuff they say they want to do. They act like they're the only ones who want to do those good things. But the results are a mess of bad laws and then a lawless mess where we don't have good laws. Now, let's talk about the Republican problems. Republicans go into power and all they do is talk, talk, talk. I mean, oh boy, we could argue that the fake Republicans, the Republican establishment helped get Trump elected because Trump got elected for people that were angry because Obama didn't deliver with health care and roads and bridges just as much as we had conservatives voting for Trump because the Republicans haven't delivered. Republicans, I don't even know if the Republican politicians believe anything. They just say whatever's popular and nice. They try to get elected and stay in power. See, see, this is the danger of the Republican politicians. They know that conservatism is a very popular idea for most people in the country. Yet, uh, I don't think that they themselves are conservatives. Instead, they take the idea that conservatism is a, such a popular idea, both in people who vote for Republicans and people who vote for Democrats, and they, they say these conservative ideas... Uh, but they actually plan to do them? No. No, they, they, they turn around and they go vote with, with the Democrats and then it, it, nothing happens. Nothing, nothing, nothing gets done anywhere. All right. Um, I, I don't know what to say uh, about the, uh, the, the problem with Republicans other than that I don't think they are who they appear to be. And the last thing we want, I mean, Trump is going to go in and he's going to build roads and bridges. Trump knows how to build roads and bridges because that was his experience. I mean, he's built a lot of buildings very cheaply and he knows how to do it. So they're not going to be any $35,000 hammers on Trump's watch. At least not, not many. All that pork barrel stuff isn't going to happen. He's also going to balance government and law. He's going to do that. Trump is going to do a good job. And then what's going to happen? Those idiot Republicans are going to get power. And that is a huge danger because the Republican politicians are fake. So, yeah, I see politics in terms of having a conservative archetype that, that should, be in, should include most Democrat and Republican voters and should include a lot of people that are pro-life or pro-choice. This conservative idea, the concept of being conservative comes down to being conservative with the ideas uh, that, that began the United States, being conservative with, with, with the ideas behind the Constitution. You can change the Constitution. There are methods for changing the Constitution, if we can all agree. But that's what conservative means. Uh, in, in Russia, conservative meant uh, more communism. Conservative means you don't want to change. We want to keep to our core ideas behind the Constitution. Liberals want to be uh, liberal with those ideas. So I have these two ideas about the liberal and the conservative archetype. And then I have the fake Republicans and the fake Democrats as far as the politicians go. And I think the Democrats not delivering on their promises and the Republicans not delivering on their promises resulted in Trump, who's going to deliver on promises of Democrat goals and Republican goals, and that's going to make the Republicans, his party, more powerful. And that's dangerous. That's kind of an interesting paradigm, isn't it? Don't hear that much. Well, there are um, a few ideas that I want to explain. And a basic perspective. Some people have experience in business. They've tried. They've seen. They've succeeded. They've done 
They've gotten stuff done. From a business perspective, they've been a business owner. They've hired people, maybe. They've worked and done and seen. And then you've got other people who've only worked for another company. They, they've they worked for a school. They've worked for a large, large factory. They've worked in as a, in a union job, maybe construction work. They've, they've, they've only had a job most of their lives. They, they, they were a manager at a restaurant, they, you know, you got people that actually start a business. He's the boss. He has to have the idea. He has to have the inventions. He has to have the skilled work himself. He has to make customers trust him. And then you've got people that have a job where they enter into another establishment He's a plumber. He's in a union. He's in a guild. There's another perpetuating, maybe territorial uh, guild type business like a plumber. Plumbers might have a guild. Don't be a plumber in my territory, maybe. Or, or they've worked for someone else in another establishment that they didn't create. And they have trouble seeing and understanding each other. The guys who've only known business have trouble understanding the people who've only had a job working for someone else or in another arena. That someone else created. And the people who've only had a job working for someone else have trouble understanding the guy that wants to create the companies and the jobs that pay the taxes. And then we've got people who can understand both, who are few and far between. And of course, you think that I think that I understand both. I think I understand some of both, but I really want to understand more of both. I grew up mostly being in the arena where the job was already made for you, such as a pastor. I mean, a pastor is a type of job in an industry and a culture where he can go to seminary and he'll probably be able to find a job as a pastor somewhere. That's easy for him. I grew up with that. And I'm really trying to cut my teeth as an entrepreneur so that I can understand what it takes to actually get business going. They have trouble understanding each other. I hear a few myths When you've only known a job that was provided for you, you will tend to think that more government regulations means more protection and safety. It doesn't necessarily. They could be bad government regulations. Here's another myth. Many people think that the Electoral College, which is a republic, is unfair. I mean, we had a minority of people, a small minority, Not a big minority, not by a large margin, a close margin. We had a a minority of people, a large minority, uh, elected the president against the will of the majority. Why is that? Well, um, that's because we live in a republic. Once the people of a state organize themselves to create their own state system of government and justice, they get a little extra credit just for doing that. If everybody wants to go live in the same state, they have a little bit less credit. Not much, but that's why there are two extra votes added to every state. That's to make sure that we live in a republic instead of a pure democracy. Because, this is the, this is the third myth I'm addressing, people think, some people think that democracy is fair. It's not. Democracy is not fair. Democracy is just tyranny of the masses. A democracy allows 51% of the people to commit genocide against 49% of the people. That democracy allows that. Do you want that? I mean, a lot of the people who complain about Trump having won the election on the grounds that it was the minority of the people who voted. That doesn't include all the conservatives and Republicans who stayed home in New York and California. And that doesn't include the illegal votes as 800,000 estimate that favored Hillary, which could have flipped uh, New Hampshire possibly, or maybe others. Even without that, saying that Trump had the minority vote and that therefore that's bad This argument comes from people who support minorities, right? I mean, all all these, you know, the Democrats are the party for the minority rights, right? But all of a sudden, they want the majority to be able to decide whatever? Are you sure that's a good idea? Trump, Trump didn't win because he was the minority vote. He won because we live in a republic where people have rights. And if you live in a state that's organized as a state 
and has its own stuff it's trying to do to look after its citizens, that state maintains certain rights, even if it doesn't have as many people as the cool, awesome beach city states. We live in a republic where the 99% cannot take away the rights of the 1%. And that's why sometimes someone wins an election with a near majority, a large minority, not, not a very small minority. That's something to think about. I, I don't, I don't think that people who want to stand up for minorities should be upset that, that, uh, that, that a, a very, very large, close minority was able to win an election. We live in a Republic so that the 51% cannot order the death of the 49% as can happen in a true, pure democracy where majority always rules. Democracy is nothing more than tyranny of the masses. That's why we need a republic where there's lots of democracy, but there's also certain rights per territory or state. Last myth. All walls are automatically always, always cruel. Um, no, they're not. They're not necessarily cruel. The question is how you build a wall. A border wall that Trump talks about and that was talked about in 2005 that I do believe Hillary even voted for. That wall would would go through the middle of nowhere where bad, dangerous people just run around. The wall that's being talked about at America's border It's not like the Berlin Wall, which went right through the middle of the road. Cut road. Road ends now. We got a wall here. Road's dead end. That was the Berlin Wall. People would go to work in the other country during the day and they'd drive home at night. It was Europe where countries are small. And they tried to go home, but there was a wall there. That's how fast the Berlin Wall went up. Now, how many times did the Democrats complain about Russia? Hmm. They didn't. The wall we're talking about has lots of doors. The wall we're talking about makes sure that people can go in and that it's a good place for them to go into. Walls are not automatically bad. We need to qualify what type of wall there is or... Or discuss, well, they're just saying that, but they're not going to keep their promise on it. Trump really wants to build a wall right through the highway so no one can go in or out of Mexico, at our border anyway. Um, You've got to make that argument. But, but don't, 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 don't assume that walls are automatically bad. <sighs> Failure to understand these basic ideas. Failure to understand what people are actually thinking to represent the other people accurately has led to Trump's election. And Trump is going to deliver. He's going to do good things. People who were angry about Trump will like him in the next election. Republicans will therefore get more power and the country is going to be in really, 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 really big, big, huge trouble. And it all started because we don't have clean, clear thinking about a number of these issues where rules and what's best is concerned. That is how I gave a speech looking at an artistic map that I drew out. That is how I explain basic ideas about politics and what people are thinking. And that has been this very special edition podcast. I'm Jesse Steele, jessesteele.com.